and welcome to this episode. We are talking today about what are the two biggest drivers that impact an investor's rate of return over the long term. And I'm here today with Chris Heeman. He is a discretionary portfolio manager, and he's been working in the industry since 1993. So welcome, Chris. Please answer this question for us. We want to know what impacts our portfolio rate of return over the long term. So please share with us. Sure, Lisa. Thanks for having me today. Um, I thought the great couple of topics that most of the return that most people experience, um, there's a lot of uh, myths and uh, misunderstandings of where does the biggest percentage of your return come from. Um, so the two biggest areas that clients and people make or investors make is not understanding what are the two areas they can focus on that has the greatest impact to their return over the long term. So the first one is your asset allocation choices. Um, asset allocation choices are really important um, because they line up in the market with um, long-term economic issues and how things are correlated internally in your portfolio. So what that means is how are things going to function or how are they going to react as a portfolio as a whole? And I kind of look at this like a recipe um, when you're cooking dinner. Asset allocation is kind of like following the recipe, making sure that you have everything that you need to make a really fabulous dinner versus doing one of those stews, you know, where you throw everything in from your pantry and everything in from your fridge and you kind of hope that it all turns out. Um, asset allocation is more like making sure you have everything in the right proportions as well, not just what the ingredients are. So you don't want too much pepper and you don't want you know, too much spice, but you do want a little bit of those things to kind of enhance the flavors. So that's what the first one is on asset allocation. Um, not to be mistaken, a lot of people talk about diversification. There's a thing out there that we're talking about right now about false diversification, just buying anything you can or making sure you have exposure in from an investment point of view in all sorts of different sectors without really having a purpose behind your investments. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is uh, how you behave as an investor, how you actually react to certain conditions and, and how your emotions kind of get in control. So understanding how you are from a behavioral point of view is the second big one. Um, I got a couple of different um, images and graphs that I thought I'd share uh, to kind of give this some visuals here. Um, when we talk about these two things, let me just share my screen. All right. So this is the first one that we were, when we talk about behavior and emotions. So most of people, they react to things. And one of the big reasons they react to things inside the market is that their portfolio isn't necessarily doing what they thought it might do. So there is points in investing where we get excited, like right now, where everything has been up and everything is fabulous and everybody's feeling fantastic and it's very euphoric. And that's actually where we get to a point of, of maximum financial risk is we're not able to make all the objective decisions maybe that we're, we should. And we have a lot of behavioral um, things that can get in our way. One of the big ones right now that we're talking about is hindsight bias, which kind of means we look in the past and we see what happens in the past and we project that out into the future, maybe a little bit too much. We think that our past is going to repeat. And we're not really paying attention to what are some of the things that could derail all this excitement and euphoria. And then when things, if you remember back in March, when things were not so euphoric, it kind of got down here at the bottom where panic started to set in and fear. And that's when human beings make the worst decisions we can. Um, there's a lot of places in our society that we do specialized training just to be able to manage what is a natural response through our brains, which for fear and panic. Um, and that's what happened back in March as people started to get really worried, lots of anxiety. And then they hit the bottom end of this curve and they start to feel a little hope and relief again. And they start to get some optimism that things are going to get better. And they start looking out into the future. All along these curves, like a roller coaster, is where we can make bad investment decisions. 
So being able to manage our behavior and understanding some of the things that we have going against us as far as behavior, we think we might be in control, but realistically our emotions um, kind of drive us. We weren't really designed for making consumer choices or investment choices. Human beings were designed to survive on the Serengeti to make sure that when the saber tooth tiger attacked us, we were going to make it out alive. So we have some fear and responses and some uh, decision responses when it comes to euphoria that can get in the way. So that's the first one. The second one I thought I'd share is on the asset allocation in regards to how does asset allocation make a difference and how you can use it as a tool. So here, what we're looking at is your classic asset allocation mix, which most people would probably be uh, experienced with, even yourself. You know, you take your typical 60-40 balance portfolio. Over time, you're supposed to get more conservative when you get older. You, If you want a bigger rate of return, you have to accept a little bit more fluctuations and a little more risk in your portfolio. And how we build these portfolios under a, a portfolio construction process is that we've used things like bonds um, in regards to our investing so that we have something safe and we have something that is not supposed to work like an equity, like a stock. And so these models have been used for the last 35, 40 years and things have changed. We're now down where interest rates are almost at zero. Some places they're negative as far as nominal rates before we add in the inflation. It, when we add in inflation, you get to a real rate um, real rates of return, then we're actually at negative in a lot of the part of the world. And so how do bonds actually function now as that protection in the portfolio? They're not quite as well designed for these environments as they originally were. And most of the benefit of owning these type of investments has already happened over the last 45, 50 years. So what we do is we show investors when we first meet with them, something that we want them to pay attention to we take out this little graph that I'm going to show you. I think you can see that now. Now this one's a little bit blurry, so I apologize. But what it shows on the left is what you're really you think you're investing in and, and how you want to be diversified. So it kind of adds up all the different ways you can buy different geographies. You can invest in Canada and the US. You can invest in Japan. You can buy tech. You can buy in bonds, you can do all sorts of different things. But on the right hand side, when we look at that from a different lens, when we look at it from a volatility perspective, then things change. And it kind of illustrates why we react and why the portfolio construction is so important. So on the right hand side, when you add up all your diversified investments, 97% of what you're investing in is actually what's called short volatility. Now, what that means is that when the markets go up, that's a benefit, but it's when things get really crazy and things drop that short volatility loses money. So 97% of your money would drop if volatility were to go up. Only 3% of the money in that portfolio would go actually go up if the markets go down. Okay. And this is what we talk about with the word correlation. Correlation means how does something move? in respect to something else. So if you have bonds in your portfolio, what you might think they're gonna do and what they actually do in this environment are two different things. And what you're trying to find is what investments do you wanna to put together like that recipe and how do you put those little pieces together? If you do it right, you get a very dramatic effect. So bear with me here, I've got one more visual to share with you. Get it up on the screen. Okay, this is what we call the Dennis Rodman paradox. And I don't know if any of you guys are sports fans, but I am. So that's why it's called the Dennis Rodman. Rodman was the absolute worst shooter. He was not um, one of the best basketball players like a Michael Jordan. But the reason he made Michael Jordan so great is he was the best rebounder, the best defensive basketball player in the game. And so when you add a Michael Jordan and a Dennis Rodman together on a team, you get this combined effect that is greater than the
the sum of the parts, okay? And so that's kind of like the recipe again. What we look at from an asset allocation point of view is we want to have things in our portfolio that act like the Dennis Rodman, that act like defensiveness. And for the past 40 years, we thought that was bonds. They did a pretty good job. But going forward, the way the economic conditions are now, bonds are not going to do what we think they're going to do and what they have done in the past. So that's that behavioral side. That's that hindsight bias. We think that because it worked for the past 30 years, it's going to work for the next 30 years. Okay. And what these two blue lines, what I show people is, as I said, if you look at taking a bit of the yellow, this is the S&P 500 or the U.S. stock market in the yellow, and you take this gray line, which is the hedge fund index, it's just one other way, a defensive way of investing, and you add them together, most people think you should get some sort of result that's in between the two. What you actually get is the blue line, okay? So by putting together an investment portfolio that has its defensive positions as well as its offensive positions, you actually get a better result. Just like Dennis Rodman and Michael Jordan, you know, you throw in a Scottie Pippen and you throw in a few other guys and you get six world championships, okay? And that's kind of the reason why we use asset allocation, why it's so important. Throwing things together like stew and just whatever you got in the cupboard, every once in a while you come together and you get something that works, but it's not consistent and it's not something you can really manage or replicate. That's the key, is being able to do it again and again. So somebody comes over to visit you for dinner and they say, absolutely, got to go to Lisa's house. She makes the absolute best stew. If you don't have a recipe for it, you're not going to be able to do it again. You're just hoping that it works the second time. But if you follow a recipe and you put the things in the positions that you need, put the spices in the way that you need it, and you follow the recipe the same way every time, you're going to be able to help manage the portfolio better and deal with that euphoria and that fear because your portfolio is not going to react like the same way. And so we kind of put the two together. If you choose the right asset allocation mix, it helps you manage all of those behavioral biases that come with being human and having emotions. And what the recipe card looks like, just to kind of finish this off and bring this all together, is you need a place to start. And so what we do is we take a look at our large picture of the economy. We say, where are we at? And what things in the portfolio are going to be good things to have? And what things do we want to stay away from? Too much hot chili pepper and your friends aren't coming back. Put a little more red wine on the table and you'll probably get more friends show up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like what we do in investing. Right now on the bottom right-hand corner of this, we are talking to a lot of people about the future of what a low interest rate environment, high unemployment in the economy, rising inflation. If you've been to the grocery store in the last, I don't know, five days or take a look from the last month, you've seen that your grocery bills are probably skyrocketing. Dairy is up. Meat proteins are up. That's all inflationary. Our commodities, there's a lot of things out there. If you're, if you're running a business like Starbucks and you have you know, milk and coffee as your main ingredients, it's costing you more to make those things. So in this environment, in this orange grid, how do you put your money into certain areas that are going to be defensive? And what areas are gonna do really well when inflation is going up and interest rates are going down, okay? We probably won't see a lot of an interest rate movement going back up over time, but we're very, very low, right? Right now to buy a 10 year bond, you're getting paid 0.63%. Okay, to hold it for 10 years. That's a long time to get paid very little. And what happened over time is that bonds were that protection, that Dennis Rodman, they were the defensive part of the portfolio. And a lot of people still have that design. Now you got to start looking for some other places. And there's a lot of other things other than bonds that you can put in the portfolio that are defensive. But one of the big things that we use is volatility. And that's for another topic, but that's... Uh, that's kind of the whole nuts and bolts around what are the two biggest drivers? What you select your investments are, like following the recipe, and how you behave as an investor are the two biggest determinants to your long-term success. Thank you so much, Chris. That is hugely helpful, even for me. And I know all the clients who listen to this will absolutely get lots of value from it. So thank you so much.
No problem. I appreciate you giving me the time this morning. And uh, if there's any other topics that you want to talk about, just let me know. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great day.